Now, women's education is a fundamental pillar of women's empowerment, serving as a catalyst that propels them towards greater independence, power, and influence in both their personal lives and within the broader society. The link between women's education and empowerment is a cornerstone of gender equality efforts, yielding numerous benefits that collectively contribute to a more equitable and progressive world. So for the next session on educating and encouraging women for a better world, we are very honored and privileged to welcome Dr. Kiran Bedi, former Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, for addressing the audience. Of course, uh, we all look up to her as a great source of inspiration. Dr. Kiran Bedi is the, the first woman to have joined the officer ranks of the uh, Indian Police Service. She was the 24th uh, Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. She served the United Nations as a civilian police advisor in uh, peacekeeping operations. Her expertise includes more than four decades of uh, public administration, creative and re reformative policing, and of course, prison management. She's also the winner of the Maxese Award, which is also known as Asia's Nobel Peace Award. And apart from her professional achievements, she's also an Asian tennis champion and past surveys uh, 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 by Reader's Digest and The Week magazine rated her as uh, India's most trusted and admired woman in the country. So let's please welcome uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi with a huge round of applause to the stage. Good morning, all of you. Nice to see Arnav after a long time. Very, very grateful to all the panelists who've contributed great food of thought and some or very original ideas. I'm glad I heard them. I'm feeling very nourished and empowered even more. Very good ideas emerged. What I have in mind for you, friends, probably it's becoming a very natural sequence of what I had in mind to share, and it, I believe it naturally follows from the panel discussions I've had. And here are my 10 thoughts, which I collected last night, but they seem to be in sync with the panels before. I did not know I would follow the panels, but I'm glad it is. Some of these thoughts, your panelist thoughts, stand consolidated in what I'm going to share with you. These are more coming out of my experience of these years as I've seen the uh, corporate world, public administration, and elsewhere. Here are my 10 thoughts. So it's not a, it's not a, a discourse, but it's, it's thoughts. First thought of mine is that behind every successful woman is herself. Why I say this? This is my experience. I don't have to go beyond that had I not been what I believed in and what I could do and had the confidence of doing it, I wouldn't have been here today. And since I'm one of your early birds who started the leadership in 70s when you were not, some of you were not even born, that it was herself. And in herself, she's not alone. In herself brings her home. Besides herself, she's not alone. She's got a whole family. And in herself, she's got a whole team. But in the team, it's more of juniors rather than the peers. And she's got very few seniors. So in herself, this is what I feel, that behind every successful woman is her family, her team, team members, juniors, not the peers. Peers have issues and very few seniors. This is, I'm talking of my time. Things have changed, as the panel very rightly said. My second thought is all women are working women. Only a few are salaried. 
my, this is my second thought. Why I say this is because many times when I ask, what are you doing these days? Oh, I'm only a homemaker. Main ghar mein rehti. Main ghar mein. She doesn't realize what a valuable work, what a contribution she's making to nation building. Because if a woman is giving all her time to the upbringing of her children, and in, the, in a very brilliant way, I think that's the greatest service she's doing. But she, she probably undervalues it. And she says she's not working. She is working. But she should say, I'm working from home. I'm working at home. Rather than saying, I'm not doing anything. I'm only living in My second thought is this, if you could carry this along. My third thing, which I picked up from Sadhguru, and Sadhguru said, rather than trying to fit a woman into a man's world, we must create a society where the masculine and feminine have an equal role to play. I have seen this emerging. I've seen this grow faster in the corporate world, certainly in the bureaucracy. You have no choice. You're selected, you're identified, you're appointed, and you're playing an equal role. But in corporate world, you are growing yet to be, uh, whether it's from the shop floor or from the board of directors. And there are many, many companies yet who have no women on the boards yet, many. I recently addressed a, a, a director's conference, a group which is training women directors, and they told me the numbers which are involved, uh, numbers of companies which still do not have women on the board. So it's still a growing issue. But question here is, we must create a society where we both of them play an equal role. Now that's where I found, now let me go back to my own department, that when women are recruited in the police service, they're not being yet given an equal role. They're not yet being given an equal role, but are emerging towards a role. And we are losing a lot of valuable human resource. And I, I believe that a woman's, particularly law enforcement, or security agencies. Her prime energy time is below 30. And if below 30, and she, before she becomes a mother, below 30 is a prime age. And if you recruited a woman at the age of 21, 22, how you use her next eight years is very, very vital for the department. Because her pattern, her energy levels after 30 in motherhood, and then beyond 40, will about to change. Whereas, it's not so much with the men. It's not so much. I've seen this happen with the women. But if those 20 to 30 years, first 10 years are lost, they're lost, or they've just been allowed to pass, she's got adjusted to a certain comfort zone, and thereafter she stays as somewhere underutilized, a potential not recognized. So at that role of 21 to 30, if you look at her as an equal role, she may remain equal role beyond 30. And so will men start accepting her as equal role. For instance, the beat system, let's say the beat constable system. When you recruit women, young, 21, 22 year, instead of putting them in control rooms, put them straight away in the field and make them beat officers, foot soldiers, they will remain foot soldiers and young sub-inspectors, etc., or um, emerge as leadership in that, in that position, that age group, as an equal role, where men will start also accepting them for equal role. But it's important that they play an equal role. It's not made equal. You've recruited them in uniform, then make them equal. Make them perform equally when you're giving them the same equal training. This is my third thought. My th next thought is, a busy, vibrant, goal-oriented woman is so much more attractive than a woman who waits around for a man to validate her existence. I think this applies to even those who have moved up and looking for validation. We don't have to. We must enter with a sense of confidence, sense of belief. They, instead of asking, am I right? or being always in doubt. So don't stop seeking validation. That's a thought I wanted to leave in your mind, which I do see many women seeking validation, even when they moved up. Uh, see, go back and seek validation from your father, for your parents, or your family, but not so much uh, with people you work with. 
My next thought, friends, is in our society, the women who break down barriers are those who ignore the limits. Every one of us who have made a way through a man's world, it was a man's world, it still is a man's world, it's a long time for a man's world to continue because it's a politically, it's a man's world. Bureaucracy is changing. Policing is still a man's world. Security agencies are still a man's world. Corporate world is still a man's world. When I say it's a man's world, because it's men predominantly taking the decisions at the right or wrong, I'm not a, being judgmental. That's the inheritance. That's what is a factor. That's strike being real. It's still a man's world. And a woman who does not break the lip, uh, who makes a breakthrough, is one who ignores the limits. She identifies a limit and considers this as an opportunity. My next point, friends, is greatness is not measured. Our greatness will not be measured by what a man or a woman accomplishes, but by the opposition he or she has overcome to reach her goals. Now, these obstacles or opposition, opposition, I think, is the, is the way men or women, now in this case, men or women, how did they counter an opposition and how did they deal with it? Not countering opposition is failure. Countering an opposition is failure learning to success, succeed. So that's another thought is where uh, applies a lot to you all on leadership at the moment. Each time, next point is, each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it, possibly without claiming it, she stands up for all women. I did not realize this, but this is so true. It is said by Maya Angelou. So true. As I travel and when I come across young teenagers or middle-aged women or about a 30-year-old in that age group, she comes up and tells me, you did this so many years ago. I have forgotten even that I did it. Or a statement came on the television or in the newspapers. It made me stand up. It made me fight back without I realizing that what I was doing was also making many other women stand up. I'm giving you a personal example of what I'm encountering without knowing that this was happening, but it's a fact. So all of us, when we stand up for our causes, Stand up for the right, stand up for the right path, stand up for the right decision, lead, encounter a correct opposition. I'm only at the moment workplace, so that's what I'm mentioning. You never know what effect it's having on men and women down below. So it's very, very important that when you are on the path, you are not living for yourself. You're actually impacting society all around you. I've got three more points, and before I... Uh, say something else. Women are not, I want to say, this is a very important set, uh, remark, which I've again seen for myself in my, in my social, in my policing. Women are not rehabilitation centers. I repeat, women are not rehabilitation centers for badly raised men. It is not your job to fix them, fix him or change him or parent him or raise him. We want a partner, a companion, not a project. I've seen many, many wealthy families and educated families, etc. They just shadi ke baad ye thik ho jayega. Kyun shadi ke baad thik ho jayega? Ye project hai kya? Jo mujhe aap de rahe ho. I've seen many people who gone wayward. They had certain habits, maybe uh, extravagance of habits. I'm not mentioning any particular habit extravagance of any habits and we know extravagance of any habit is is not healthy and we start get, getting thinking that we are identifying i think that's where the parents have a very important role and that they're failing to perform that they're passing on their sons to uh, educated bright children bright girls as rehabilitation projects and before it's too late to recognize they actually had a project and then probably become parents, parent, motherhood, and does not know what to do. The last, but not least, is, and this is a fact, this is where we are, I like to expand a little, a whole generation worked to empower women. 
and his generation is working to empower women. Look the way we have girl-child campaigns. Whole generation is talking about the girl-child. A whole generation worked to empower women, but forgot to teach men how to live with empowered women. That's another challenge which you women are particularly facing. We probably didn't have that kind of challenge, but I didn't have that kind of challenge because I settled it early on, saying, I'm joining the uniform, and we're going to have two homes. You will live here, I'll live here, we'll meet when we can. That's it. It was settled much earlier. Had I said, no, no, if I, then if I'm getting into the service, well, what will we do? I was never in doubt. I'm in uniform, you travel, I'm not going to take leave. I am on uniform, I'm on traveling, I'm on patrolling. You join me? Would you like to join? And of course he did. Fortunately, I'm just being a little personal and to say, but that is an exception to the rule. That's not what I see today. I still do not see friends as a whole generation. I have started a campaign from my own NGO, and I think it might interest Erna, Erna is, or even the Republic Television. I'm starting a good boy campaign. We are always talking about empowered girls. Where is the good boy campaign? Because whenever I'm asked, why is this particular man, has he committed, he's raped another girl, and he's done this, and I keep asking, and she said, police ne kuch ni kiya, police ne kuch ni kiya. I said, police to karegi. But what about the parents who groomed him? What about the school which created him? He, is not, he was not born rapist, he's not born. He has learned it by absolute irresponsible behavior over the years. So I think that's what we need to do, balance. I think there's been an imbalance. While we continue the girl-child campaign, we now need to do parallelly a good boy campaign called the good boy. Good boy means a responsible boy. So Anab, if it interests you, I'm with you on that, is a good boy campaign. That means we go out, connect with, create youth, uh, youth groups, and in the youth boy groups, and then give them a sense of social responsibility, community work to serve, and doing gratitude, and doing giving. It's like responsible. And once these boys grow up, they will value. And then, of course, we some, at some stage integrate them with also courageous girls. So we have courageous girls, we have responsible boys. What we're having is we're trying to encourage girls and make them more courageous, but leave the boys out from responsible behavior. Unless you have responsible boys, how will you have responsible men? And how will you have responsible men in the corporates or in families if, the, if your grounding has been weak? I thought these are the few thoughts I would share with you. Um, I hope it takes forward the panel discussions uh, uh, I think what is really the biggest challenge for a corporate woman today is not her profession. Now that's, that's being um, as close to reality as what it is as I see. It's not her profession anymore. She's skilled, she's got the attitude, and she's got the aptitude. She's got all the three, and she's hungry, and she wants to serve. She's only looking for their op opportunities. The problem is when you have projects at home, and when you have projects who don't understand and don't, and Indra Anui handled it very well. Indra Anui's husband, I think is a very rare combination I've come across, who gave up a lot for her, kept accommodating for her, and she kept accommodating for him. But in, if you would read her book, then it is he who accommodated much more. Not her parents, not her in-laws. I think what's lacking here is, A, we have projects, Secondly, we don't have social systems in place. We don't have social systems to back up working women, corporate working women in leadership. We don't have day boarding schools. We don't have close by uh, uh, creches to handle their children when they go, because six months is not enough. The child needs the mother always. Who says it doesn't? They need a parent always. And being left alone by themselves, I think that's the I think toll which is taking on our children at the moment in their upbringing. So where do we cover up? We can't keep women back home only to do, be at home. What we really need is a larger corporate and social systems backing up. A, we have a day boarding school. A, we have a geriatric care. A, we have 
play with schools so that a work or peer support where the child can be not left alone when she or he, she or the parents return from work. I think today the challenge is not for a professional woman, her profession or the corporate world, which is changing and it will continue to change and evolve. I have no, no doubt it would comp keep going, moving up. Challenge is how does a corporate world create social systems around her to have a child uh, here admitted in the playway and she comes back and picks up the child and goes home. Or we have a day boarding school where the homework is over for the, school, for the child and the ch mother doesn't have to say homework here. Can Three, her support systems, social support systems, family support systems, maybe delegated support systems to run a kitchen. She is desperately in need of time. Unless, of course, cooking is her hobby. Every woman's hobby is not cooking. She needs rest at that time. And she needs as much rest as the man would to unwind in any way. So what kind of support systems we create? I think these are the real challenges for you women in corporate world. Nothing like this exists in the policing. Still, they're not even talking about it. They're not even talking about it. So the, therefore, the um, pol policing women will continue to suffer a lot. I know they're going to suffer a lot. And by the time they're about 30, 40 plus, they wouldn't know how to get back into the uniform. How do they value and respect the field work? The department is, I do not know even they created these social systems department. This is where they're desperately behind time. But the corporate world can afford, maybe charge the uh, women in need. The change in the corporate, challenge in the corporate world for a working woman is now not her career, not her skill, not her attitude. No, but her holding back her home, which is actually her strength but which is actually also becoming somewhere, in many cases, a big dream. That is what needs to be addressed. I want to thank you for the opportunity you gave me to speak.